turn it on. Oh, there it is on now. <laughs> Okie doke. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, we'll make a start. The um, final session before afternoon tea. Um, my name is uh, Tim Kong, uh, and if you were in the previous session, I had a brief introduction of myself. Uh, I'm a primary school teacher at Seatoon School in uh, Wellington. I uh, had the privilege of teaching Ben, who also presented in the previous session. So it's nice to see some success from some of the things I might have had an input in. Uh, but this session is um, on competitive collaboration and what that means. Uh, and it's quite a paradoxical statement. Um, if you'd seen the briefing notes, uh, it was a statement that uh, the current Minister of Education used uh, in her presentation at Learning at Schools, uh, which was in Rotorua this year. Uh, and in putting the session together, the idea was to try and unpack that somewhat paradoxical statement. Um, if I've just got a bit of a brief intro and some thoughts, uh, and then it's really sort of an open forum, really, for people to contribute. Uh, I know we've got a couple of people from the education sector. Hopefully we've got them from more uh, than just primary school, which I represent. Um, and I'm really keen to hear from people in, in secondary, in tertiary, uh, the, some of the library uh, learning services, any of those uh, areas. But also, I think it's important to hear from people who are interested in education and interested in, in learning. And I think that's a, you know, you can pretty much guarantee that's 100% of the population to some degree uh, or another. Um, so please, yep, uh, we'll have uh, probably just come down to the front again, or I can bring the mic, we can bring the microphones out to you to, to share. Um, the theme uh, of this uh, whole NetHui is about uh, shaping the future together, together and how the internet impacts on all of us. Uh, and one of the neat things for me in terms of being here for the first time has to see, has to um, have lots of little light bulb moments in each of the sessions that I've been to um, at, that have related directly to, to what I do in the sector that I work in, that was education. So in the first section uh, with the keynote from Pamela, it was her talk of privacy by design and she had a slide of what that means. And I, all I could think to myself was, was national standards. What happens if a parent decides to opt out of this data gathering exercise because they own the rights to their data? Uh, and what does that then do to the validity of the data if parents are opting out of it? Uh, and, you know, all those things come into play. I went to a health, uh, on telehealth, uh, one of the health sessions on telehealth, and some of the language in there was just like the language I have to do in education, where they were talking about it's not the technology or the tool. Uh, and you have to manage change. And I was thinking, wow, that's just what we have to deal with. Um, Judge Harvey's presentation on uh, cyberbullying and bad behavior, um, if you take away the cyber and you take away the bullying and you take away all the ways that you try and deal with it, that's exactly what you do every day in the class in terms of managing behavior. Um, the copyright issues, which were alluded to in the, in the previous session in terms of Creative Commons, a huge impact. And so for me, it's been really powerful to be in a space where a lot of these different issues that in terms of their design, our separate strands all really link together. And I think it's important um, that we see that as they're linked together uh, and as we go forward um, with the shaping the future and how the internet and what it does impacts on all of us. Um, coming back to education and this talk, one of the key tensions, key tensions I think, um, in, in our current education, public education, is this idea of competitive collaboration and also the idea about the business of education uh, and for me, in a real simple way of describing it, a love of learning. Um, because I, re I, and I was sort of doing some research last night before I got home, and I thought, well, I'll jump online and see what the Ministry of Education says about learning. And I'll just jump to it really quickly. And I know we're not meant to do this very often in, in NetHui, but um, I found it quite powerful to look at this site. And this is the nature and scope of the functions of the Ministry of Education. It's just one page. And I thought, well, I'll just do it quick, and I'll go Apple F, and I'll type find, and I typed in L-E-A-R-N-I-N-G. I typed in learning, and it's a big red. You probably can't see it from down there, but there is no, the word learning is not mentioned at all on this page, which lists the nature and scope of the functions of the Ministry of Education. <laughs> And that's not to beat up um, the Ministry of Education, but that's just to, to state that really clearly I think there is a real difference between this uh, ministry which provides education and the delivery of education and the framework for education and then people who are creating and delivering uh, and engaging on a daily basis with learning and young people and old people 
And uh, I think the tension between those two things is, is kind of what sits at the heart of competitive collaboration. Um, because I think collaboration is about sharing and about being open and about being transparent. Uh, and the business of education doesn't always feed into that same model. Um, I think uh, that when you, as you look at these two things, if as they are constantly engaged and constantly related, depending on where the pressure is going in or where the most emphasis goes in, the, the, the other side changes or switches. So, I mean, a really clumsy example is the national standards and what they meant to primary schools and how they have affected uh, maybe not learning programs, um, but for me, in a, in a really... Uh, clear way this year was the first year I felt like in my mid-year conferences I was actually having to justify whether I told a child, told a parent's child they were at, above or below. And it was an interesting change for me to go from the conversation being around the child and what they were learning to me justifying my position as an employee of the state who was educating them. And so that's a quite a powerful thing for me and in, in a way quite an insidious thing. So it's that tension, constant tension and then there's lots of other examples that came up in the, in the mailing list. Um, you know, the network for learning that's being uh, promoted, um, things like national standards, um, how do we collaborate, uh, whether we collaborate. Uh, in the uh, session this morning at the parliamentary inquiry, uh, one of the um, MPs asked, well, can we, you know, what do we have to do to collaborate? Uh, and Claire made the point that, well, we can already collaborate. The thing is, we don't. <laughs> uh, and at some levels, that's partly the way we're funded. Um, schools are funded based on numbers of students and bums on seats. So why, what uh, specific, I don't have any incentive to collaborate with you because if I collaborate and your school looks better to that parent and they take my student down, to you, down the road to you, well then I lose some funding. So there's some structural things there in play. Um, at the same time, I mean Claire's example of digital citizenship in the last one is a fantastic example of teachers just connecting totally separately from the fact that they're in schools or or you know, employed and paid by the Ministry of Education, but are connected by a love of learning and have, and you saw that list if you're in that session, of dozens of teachers and educators who are giving up their time and ideas and sharing them freely. So there's really powerful forces, I think, on both sides. Um, and I guess, the, I, don't, I guess the purpose of this session is to hopefully share some of those if you've got your own experiences, um, to, to throw in any critiques of anything I've said, <laughs> uh, and also, to, I guess, start conversations and connections. Um, similar to what Dave finished his session on, I think it's important that, you know, we, we present details here, but that the bar camp there is also there tomorrow to kind of talk in more and more smaller group detail. Um, so with that said, um, I'd just like to open the floor to anyone who has uh, contributions or ideas, or like I said, critiques of what I've said. I'm open to that. <laughs> Hi, my name's Dean. Um, hi, I'm not a teacher, but the way um, the interaction I have with the education community is through being one of, one of the trustees on the Wellington Loop Trust. And certainly the um, schools that we have involved within the Loop um, value quite highly the um, collaboration that they get through the Trust. Um, and it, it's, it's, interesting, it's interesting to hear from from other school communities that that there is this competition and maybe this not quite so willingness to collaborate because you know the of of the um, competition for students and and um and and that sort of stuff whereas once once you've had a high level of collaboration you you value that far higher than anything else and, and we've seen We've seen people that have been involved in the loop and then moved schools and done everything they can to get their new school back engaged because they value, the, they value that level of collaboration so much that when they move, they miss it. So, Charles, I might call on you. <laughs> um, Charles uh, Newton, who works in Nelson and has some experience, obviously, with the Nelson loop. Um, uh, just talking with Charles last night about some of the um, infrastructural things and some of the changes that have done uh, in their schools on that loop. Would you be able to talk to that, Charles? If you could. Just, I suppose, on a similar vein, really, in terms of the impact of the loop. 
Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I'm just sitting looking at the work of Stephen Downs, which, which many of you will have looked at. And also he refers to the work of a guy called Harold Janch, I think it was G-A-R-C-H-E. And in fact, they talk about the fact that cooperation trumps collaboration in networks. So you, you see the word cooperation isn't up there on the wall. Okay. And in fact, I think schools are a lot better at cooperating than they are at collaborating. It's worth thinking about because to collaborate, you have to have shared vision. You know, it, it requires a greater degree of buy-in. Whereas cooperation, you can co cooperate and compete, but often collaboration takes you to another level. And I think we need to be sort of think carefully about that. You know, and I suggest you go and have a look at that work of Stephen Downs, and I'll stick a link to it somewhere so people can find it. So, I mean, in, in Nelson, we've, we, we were the first um, group to build a, an ultra-fast broadband loop. And what I see there is both cooperation and collaboration. And, and in a way, simply by some of members of that group or, or partners in the loop, cooperate or, or actually collaborate simply by paying a fee, even though they're not particularly in a collaborative mindset, but in fact, by paying that fee, they are enabling a wider thing to occur. So I'm not, quite, I'm not quite sure what the word for that is, sleeping cooperation, collaboration, sleeping collaboration. That should go down well in someone's Twitter feed. But, um, you know, and then on the other hand, I see, you know, I definitely see cooperation. And in fact, the cooperation came, interestingly, from those who needed to cooperate most, who in fact were the technicians because in fact our loop was built by technicians who had the vision to see that the future was connected, fibre, web two, before these things were really being talked about. And all they saw coming towards them was a tsunami that they simply on their own couldn't survive. And you know, almost a decade on, when, when I look around now in my position where I can visit other schools as well, I'd have to say I see an awful lot of schools struggling on their own when really they need to be working as part of a bigger group. So the imperative to collaborate at a technical level, actually it was a very strong driver in our loop. What we've seen more recently is, is that we are actually seeing some genuine collaborations on top of the cooperative opportunity in the fact that a campus of schools have put got together and put in a, a, um, a wireless system that covers a campus rather than just, you know, just themselves. Um, we've got, for the last five years, the two biggest schools have been sharing servers. So they don't have, they, they've shared a virtual server. They both had to um, replace their servers. So instead of doing it individually, they club together and set up a virtual server, which they're now offering to other people. So those are genuinely collaborative endeavors but I wouldn't say that it's a loop-wide thing. So in a way, we've, we've built a, a cooperative framework. And then within that, you're starting to see pockets of serious collaboration. So I suppose I just leave that thought there, that I think schools, sh I think the way to start is start by cooperating. And then out of that, as needs often drive, you may head towards greater collaboration. Uh, kia ora, thanks for the topic. I mean, it's interesting to think about um, other sectors, for example the research sector and the government sector where this isn't um, people's normal mode of operating but we've managed to get some changes regardless. It's and I don't want to try and uh, talk in cliches but you can do a lot. And it's just a case of finding the other people who wanted to do similar things, sharing stuff between you and just trying to get some traction. But the difficult thing, I guess, is doing that on top of your, on top of your job and also the sort of sometimes a glacially slow <laughs> pace of change. So, but, I mean, you know, it's, not just, it's not just your sector that's having these problems. 
So, as, as I'm sure you know, um, as I say, the research sector is another, is another area. So, hopefully, we can at least keep in touch and try and share what works. Charles, if I can just come back to one of the things you said. You said initially it was led by the technical side. And, and the example you gave of the campus, was that campus connected to the loop or was it a separate campus that sort of was then starting, or those two schools that grabbed the servers? Uh, were they on the loop? As it, so yeah, and by, um, in those, both those cases, I mean, we've, what we've now got is they are using the fact that there is this, a, a, I get my words right here, thanks to the collaboration of the group of schools working alongside um, um, network Tassin Limited, who are actually the people who provided the fibre in the first place. So there is a collaboration there between business and, and, and education, which was fantastic. I would describe the loop more as a cooperation rather than a collaboration. But now on top of that potential, or, or on top of that infrastructure, you are now getting schools collaborating and that collaboration increasingly has been driven by educational needs rather than technical needs. So the group of schools who are putting together the wireless um, network are within a radius of each other. So in other words, they can, it's easy for them to do, but they're using the loop as the backbone to do that. But the really neat thing about that is it's driven by, an, by a, a desire to teach and learn in a particular way that requires a wireless. In other words, the loop didn't come along and say, it'd be a really good idea if, you, if this campus had a wireless, here we go. But initially we did. Initially we said it'd be a really good idea if all the schools in Nelson and Marlborough could be hooked onto fibre. And that's what we're going to do. And so we did that without a educational prerogative. It was more, because sometimes you've just got to take a punt and think, what's the future going to look like? And you can't, if you wait around for a group of schools, and I suspect that's the same for a group of any things, if you wait around for a group of schools to manage to work out collaboratively that they need to throw some money on the table and build a network, well, you know, you'd, you'd still be here when hell freezes over. And that's after global warming. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you can, um, if you can foster collaboration in in one area, like between the um, technicians, and that's and, that, and and that's very similar to what we saw on the Wellington Loop. If you can, if you can foster collaboration there, it brings you a step closer to collaboration everywhere else as well. So you know, collaboration there will start to bring collaboration within PD and all that sort of stuff yeah. as well. And and we started off with um, um, shared servers and, and schools using those, and now we're looking into into going out and getting. Um, shared other services as well, but that's that's all been a push for what for what the schools need and looking at and looking at the commonalities and how they and how they can collaborate. Um, but yeah, you know, large things grow from small. So if you can find the the smallest way that makes sense to collaborate, that brings you one step closer to the next step and the next step and the next step after that. Can I just add one last thing? Because I have to go in a minute. Um, the, the other thing that's, that is interesting when you look, if we just look at the loops around the country, you know, a, as an example, um, each of there's always something serendipitous about the way this cooperation or collaboration starts, and that's why I think go for cooperation, and then out of that, hopefully, the that that um, primordial what do you call um, primordial fluid of uh, that, 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 you know, you need certain things to happen for true collaboration to emerge. And actually, it's good that I was talking about the fact we move from technical to educational. You're also moving, um, you need key people. And in each of the collaborations that I'm thinking about, there were one or two people who stepped up. And, and it often takes someone to really step up, step out, for that, you know, for others to follow and, and for things to, to actually make that transition from cooperation to collaboration. And I think part of the game, especially amongst leaders, is you don't necessarily have to do it yourself, but you need to find or inspire or push or nudge or bribe or whatever people to, to be the people who get out the front and front these things. And I think that's another challenge of developing collaboration. 
No, thank you. I think just as you're saying that, I was thinking one of the things about serendipity is when you go to your board to ask for the money to build this thing that's going to allow cooperation, serendipity isn't something they want to hear. <laughs> they want to hear, you know, outcomes and measures and what this will mean. And I know, I mean, I, I know what you're saying, but it's, I know I've had that conversation with the board. Um, so, yeah, it's that, again, it's that tension between what's it going to do and deliver and what it might do and deliver. Um, we'll go to Paul and then... I've got a, a couple of different thoughts. The first one is that what's mostly been seen as the unit between which cooperation happens is the institution, and yet we have different units of that accountability, effectiveness, efficiency drive sort of in organisation management. Those, the boundary of the unit or the set is placed in different places depending on the need. So in a health system, there are periods when we have quite strong competition between regional entities and other times where services are orchestrated across those boundaries as, I suppose, we seek to find a balance for where should the boundary for that accountability, that allocation of resource be. So in education, we could think of an organisation institution that's set up with a charter and a board and a, some regulation, some accountability, some resourcing, and they're charged to do to perform a task and achieve some outcomes, and we put a boundary around that institution and hold them to account. And yet within some schools, they actually break that down and establish, almost of their own volition, a degree of competition within their school, where they're seeking to get improvement uh, between teachers even within the organisation, and that's a choice of that management approach. And yet we also have people talking about cross-school boundary, are there aspects of education where the boundary should include more than one institution? So through the last couple of days, people have talked about resource creation, you know, better use of time, procurement in a syndicated way, professional development done more sustainably, and it doesn't seem like the boundary of the institution is suitable there. I think we're, for the school sector, facing some interesting time as we hear or find out what the government have in mind for remuneration for teachers. With the you know, very small number of messages being given around how pay might look going forward, is the team aspect of remuneration going to be within the school, within the department, within your syndicate? I don't know. So the first part is just we set the boundary for the set or the unit at different places according to some policy need. And if we would like to shape it nationally, then that's the language we've got to find and use. The second thought, quite unrelated, is just is around the ability of uh, being connected in terms of an electronic network internet sense to facilitate cooperation where people are willing. So from different loops, from individual schools working with other schools around the country, international links, or just individual classroom teachers who've connected there's wonderful facilitation or cooperation enabled by being connected, but it, it wasn't necessary, nor is it sufficient on its own. And that if the people aren't willing, no amount of connectivity or wiredness will bring a positive outcome from, from cooperative work. And yet where people are willing, the nice thing about the technology is they don't have to be near you geographically, so you don't have to be... I've met people today, yesterday here, that I've never seen before, and yet I've worked with them on joint things around... You know, it's that sort of... It's a nice to have when it's there, but you have to find people who share the same willingness, the same sort of how much will you ante up for this round. Perhaps the connectedness does increase the pool you can draw on, and if it's a low proportion of people willing to work with you, you've got a better chance as it gets bigger. But I'd just echo, start with the willing, whether there's only two of you. Now, that's where cooperation begins, and build on whatever amount is given willingly in the beginning. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was kind of a question. I was wondering, um, with this competitive uh, environment, like how do cluster schools fit into this? It's not something that I know heaps about, but I know that a bunch of schools all in the same region who are probably competing for the same bums on seats. Uh, but they're working together and doing research together, so I wonder how that fits in. And 
The other thing I wanted to say, just from working in libraries, is that uh, just the simple fact of liaison, just getting a bunch of people into a room together to talk about whatever they want, and they all work in the same industry, uh, is a really powerful thing, because all of a sudden you start saying, oh, you do that over there? And, and that's, oh, I could use that. And, and you could... Cr- you suddenly see all these opportunities for collaborate, uh, cooperation, at least. Uh, what, as soon as you look outside your own box, your own institution that you're working in, and uh, collaboration can just grow from there. So just put a bunch of people in a room from now and, now and then. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm talking to the, both points, but the second one first, I think um, one of the things that we do have to do in education uh, is to look up occasionally. Uh, sometimes we're so focused on what's happening in our own room, our own school, <laughs> um, and and I think you know I've always wondered myself structurally. It's interesting, and I know in some of the other conversations there's been talk about what we're doing with teacher education, but I always really remember distinctly when I went back to um, train, retrain as a teacher uh, when I was 30. That the first day we went into college, um, we all went into a big room together and had a big welcome, and as we walked out of that door, all the primary ones were told to go left and all the secondary ones were told to go right. And we never met each other again for the rest of that course. And then we went off to our schools and did our own thing. And that, I always, as I went out that door, I wondered, but aren't I supposed to work with them? Because if I'm teaching, don't my students go to them? And it was, and, and I think, you know, whether, in, you know, if you get into the, I don't really want to go down the union discussion, but um, there is a totally separate union for the secondary and there's a totally separate union for the primary. And they represent very different interests and they represent them very well. So even within that, our, you know, our own, teaching model, even though we say we're all about collaboration, we have structural differences in how we train and, and how we actually organise ourselves. Um, so I think, you know, looking up out of the box um, is important. Um, I think the second point on, on clusters, and I haven't had a lot of experience with them, so maybe some other people are, often those clusters are formed out of uh, ministry initiatives that supply a large sum of money to that cluster to work together for a certain length of time. Uh, and that cluster uses that money up very well as to, to make a difference. I know in my first two years, I was involved in a cluster in Lower Hutt uh, dealing with literacy, uh, and even that was a struggle. I think the first four sessions were people arguing about how their data was going to be used because they didn't want their data to show that they might, may or may not be teaching very well, even though the, the thing we were trying to solve was that none of the, you know, that writing was low in this particular case. And so even in, in that, you know, formal cluster designed collaboration. We all sat and argued about who was going to share whose data. Um, I mean, to the to the to the worst point, where I actually had we were told to go to the secondary college who was part of the cluster to administer the test because it was a primary school test, and those teachers didn't know how to administer that test. So we went up to administer the test to collect the data for their their students, just so that we had data. I mean, it was again one of those instances where you sat there and I thought, something's not right here. <laughs> um, so there are those constant models. Um, and I think, you know, and I keep referring to Claire, but she did such a good job this morning in the inquiry. We, we have opportunities to collaborate, you know, structural, formal, but things fall down for different reasons. Um, and some of them are structural, some of them are personal and ego, some of them are, are fear, I think, of, of what happens with the data. I don't know how many other people feel the same way as me or um, how much of the public knows of the existence, but I feel really uneasy about the introduction of like business and privatised kind of concepts into the public sector in general. It's something that's happened in the last 20 years and it's, it's scary and kind of counterintuitive to me. I don't know. Uh, to here, Andy here, and then Tara just here. I, I was just going to pick up the point about getting people together to, uh, to you know, to work together on it, on, on these sorts of things. You know, if you're going to do the collaboration. Um, earlier this year, I was in uh, Morocco and Tanzania, teaching to university people about how to build their networks together. You know, so, um, and in both cases. Uh, both in Morocco and in Tanzania, they had never got all their people together 
who you know build and support the, the technical networks in the universities in those countries. And they're, I mean, compared with our schools here, they've got a long way to go. Even, even compared with our schools here, they've got a long way to go. Never mind universities. Um, and the big thing at the end of the workshops for all of them was not. I mean, they learned some stuff. I hope you know, but they all went away with this. Uh, collegiality, you know, if I have a problem, I know I can talk to you, you know, and that, that's stuff you cannot, you cannot pay, for, pay money for that. That's just the fantastic stuff because those people, I've seen it now in the three months since I came back, are solving problems together from different institutions. So even though they're notionally competing, you know, at one level they're competing, but it's in their interests to cooperate. And if you can get people to understand it's in their interest to cooperate even while they compete, um, it's a powerful thing. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just interested to see um, where some of the uh, where some of the drivers are for for education around this. Whether we whether we feel that we have drivers that that want us to uh, compete or drivers that want us to collaborate. Um, so. And where do we actually want to go? So when we have a, a statement like the idea of competitive collaboration, is that a thing that we want? Is that a thing that is possible? Is that a thing that is uh, demonstrably useful? Or is the best thing that we want for education? And I think it's worthwhile to constantly check how many assumptions we make when we talk about competitive collaboration. Are we talking about square circling? And I think it's, it's really, the onus is, is, is on someone to, to demonstrate that not only is this possible, but that in the context of education, it is useful and is possible and is, is really something that is better than all of the other things we could do, would be better than collaboration and, and only collaboration. Um, and you know, when you talk about some of the business models coming through, the idea of measurement comes through and the idea of accountability. And all of those, uh, I guess that there's that bullet point list that leads to um, it's the kind of accountability that can damage what you wanted education to be. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just interested to see where those, where those drivers are. We've got schools that just want to collaborate. And when we're talking about the, the servers uh, coming together and, and sharing that, I mean, that came out of an environment where they needed to share and were driven to share. So as custodians of large systems, we need to consider how do we design these systems such that the behaviours uh, will naturally spring from that, as opposed to simply talking around how to do it. The system itself can encourage collaboration and, or competition. At the moment, there's some heavy competition drivers. Um, I'd like to be a bit more positive and take it from the um, learning point of view, because I have no knowledge or desire of knowledge of wires, um, or education if the term learning is not involved with that. I can um, just kiss that one goodbye too. Um, but don't underestimate teachers. There's amazing collaboration going on um, all day, every day. Um, I teach in a school um, in a team teaching environment, so um, we have our kids, and in my particular hub, there's three teachers teaching at the same time, and in Lisa's hub, there's four teachers teaching at the same time. So there's collaboration going on there. If you ever um, go on Twitter at night and dare to um, hashtag something to do with education, you will see a constant stream of information, and you will see teachers collaborating and sharing resources um, all night. Um, even if you are on there all night, you can't possibly keep up with the information and the sharing that's going on. So that's happening. Uh, we have um, Ignition that Mark Osborne um, started up, where teachers come together in an unconference situation and collaborate and share ideas. We have edu camps running all over the country um, every term. Um, the, did you invent edu camps, Fiona? No, but Fiona's got a, a lot to do with them. <laughs> Um, and there's a constant wiki space available for that for you to see where, edu where the latest EduCamp is. Um, there's one in Auckland next weekend. Just a bit of heads up there. Um, we have, um, that came out of Ignition, we have Ignite evenings that run um, on um, historically Thursday week nine of every term um, that have been running in Auckland for the past year and we've just picked that up in Wellington. So I think that 
it's a little bit, just a little bit doomy and gloomy for, for me, and I, I think that what my take of this session was that we have got wonderful collaboration going on, and I'm concerned, like you are, that if we introduce this business model, that that's going to squash the wonderful things that are already happening, as opposed to the competitive collaboration model is going to start something up that doesn't exist, because I think it's there. Um, and if we model that behaviour with our kids too, so there's um, like Stephanie and many other people probably here, we have classroom blogs, we collaborate with children from other schools, we collaborate with children in other parts of the world, we share movies, we lift the quality of our kids' education um, through kids globally giving feedback to each other. We have book clubs globally. We have authors that come into our classrooms um, online and talk to our kids. So I think the collaboration's there. Um, so I, I just hate you to leave this session thinking that we can't do it because we do it and we do it really well. I'm with you on this, absolutely, and I'd I'm, I'm like to pick up this business about what you mean by co competition. I've spent the last three years teaching at Victoria in the network engineering school, so um, I know it's not high school, you know, but I used to be a high school teacher, so I understand at least some of that stuff. Uh, the universities have been at this competitive bit uh, with very little collaboration for the last 20 years, and it is a crock, <laughs> the competition. You know, they have beaten each other up to try and take students, and it has, in a lot of ways, has destroyed the collegiality in the university. So you're more likely to be collaborating with someone outside New Zealand than with someone in New Zealand. So be, I, I would ask you to think about it and be aware. I mean, if you're going to compete, compete on behalf of your students against the system or with the system, so you're competing for them, you know, and, and actually helping them. But the collaboration is the, is the strong thing, absolutely. Oh, and I should make it clear, whether it's, you know, didn't mean to lead it too doom and gloomy, the statement is really, you know, I'm not saying this is what we need. It's, I'm unpacking something that the minister said. Uh, and, and, and like I said, I think in the briefing, it, it comes loaded, I think, with a whole range of, you know, preconceptions. Um, it's, it's the same crap they've been trotting out for 20 years, and they've given it to you guys after it doesn't work in the universities. <laughs> Uh, I know there's some people in the room that actually don't like the thought of business models, but to me the entire phrase of um, competitive collaboration brings back um, one of the key models out of the uh, 80s business classic In Search of Ex Excellence by Peters and Waterman, uh, where they argued that a lot of the um, excellent companies in their survey were were that way because they highly divisionalised and fostered intense competition between them, but at the same time they were one corporation, so if there was a problem to be solved, every division contributed to that solving that problem. And in one sense, I see there's a parallel there with you have lots of schools, but they're all part of the Ministry of Education with an overarching um, objective. So. Yes, I agree with the people that don't like business practices that you can't just pick up and, and translate without thought something that's intended for the corporate world, but there's certainly some models there that can be intelligently applied. Yeah, and I think, um, I think you're right, Peter, in the, but also in the sense of I think of all the things that Tara described, that's collaboration around learning. And, what some and it's the, probably technically illegal too. Yeah, it is, yes. And that, I mean, we go to the digital citizenship stuff, you know, how important it is to have Creative Commons as the default, for example, for our schools, so that we can be doing that without breaking the law every time we're sharing some of our ideas. But I, I mean, all of those collaboration models are, are, are collaboration around learning experiences. And one of the things, just for an example, for the, you know, use it as an example for the network for learning, is actually about collaborating on. Um, you know, resources and about, you know, central government basically making things cheaper by procuring things centrally. Uh, but I guess, and I'm, I think like many people who know anything about the Network for Learning, which isn't a lot yet, um, I'm sceptical of what that means when you deliver a, a, an essentially neutral technology 
um, that then allows a government to do things with everyone connected. And so they can say it's going to increase collaboration, uh, even though we know that collaboration is already available by walking down the road and chatting with some people and saying, well, let's work on something together. Um, the network's not going to increase collaboration. Um, and no. <laughs> the, the network for learning will take the resources they're going to take out of Europe, state asset sales, and transfer it through the network of learning to a bunch of high-tech companies. A um, couple of, couple of tongue-in-cheek comments here. Um, they've already started privatizing the prisons, so now they're talking about doing the same with schools. So does government see some connection there? I don't know. Um, the other thing I'll say is that I would, as a motivator to lead schools to cooperate and collaborate, um, I can highly recommend Natural Disasters from Christchurch. And I think there's been some interesting models, and if you know, I'm, I haven't been down there, but just hearing anecdotally, again, this idea of competitive collaboration, and one of the things Mark was saying to me, that when Auckland was called on to share resources with, with Christchurch, because uh, schools had lost their resources, they said, yeah, that's fine, we'll share them with Christchurch, but as long as they don't get back to another school in Auckland. And I found that quite an interesting thing, that people were willing to collaborate, um, but not but as long as it was with someone in another island in a disaster. <laughs> but I do know, and I don't know if you can speak to that in terms of, you know, the collaboration around just sharing sites and, and what that's meant. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, yeah it's, as I said, it was tongue-in-cheek, but it really has brought together, um, especially in the, in the, at the secondary level, um, the schools um, working together down there. Um, and the other thing, and I, I don't mean to be negative, but the other thing that has also contributed to that is the fact that um, the schools down there have lost quite a large number of teachers due to the dropping roles, um, and then it's sounds like we're going to be facing some school closures over the next um, coming months. Um, and I think um, the schools and the teachers um, and the community down there um, are stepping up and they're saying, well, we have to work together. Um, we're not going to necessarily have the resources to provide our students with all the, the coursework and the classes that they need. Um, there's a number of areas where we've already started um, working together using tools like VC, um, video conferencing, so um, uh, mentoring, um, um, scholarship students, um, languages, you know, um, and there's, there's a number of other initiatives that we're working on. Um, and we've also started talking with the University of Canterbury where um, we're looking at a program whereby senior students at University of Canterbury, the tertiary students, will provide mentoring and, and tutoring to secondary students. So um, the next um, issue, I suppose, is to try and drive that down through the intermediate and primary levels, which we're working on. And also, I think, I mean, following, it's the third time I've referenced you, Claire, following Claire's lead with the digital citizenship, I mean, if you were able to share that kind of, that workflow and that how-to with other schools, with other areas, that would be fantastic, because that's the kind of stuff where, you know, you're learning from a real experience, and if we can learn from you as well without having the natural disaster to cause us to do it, then that would be fantastic. Thank you. I'm John Graves with uh, Slide Speech, a new startup here in Auckland. But I wanted to reflect on uh, the fact that Chris Clay, a teacher here at Botany Downs Secondary College, won Microsoft Technology Teacher of the Year globally for the wiki uh, lessons in physics that he provided to the Christchurch kids. So we are, we are seeing some crisis-driven uh, opportunities to share. The, the, the one, uh, I, I attended all of the inquiry uh, hearings today, and I think the, the committee was telegraphing a bit about what what they plan to report by saying a classroom without walls and, and learning opportunities that go beyond just the, the students in the classroom into the whole family and the community. Uh, Anthony uh, Salcido just came to University of Auckland and, and announced to the whole faculty there, your students are learning without you. And there really is this whole movement towards devices like these mobile phones and tablets that enable students to learn uh, in all kinds of venues other than, than the classroom. And the initiative that I hadn't heard about until the inquiry uh, that I th found very interesting is based uh, at the National Library. Uh, I don't know if you know about uh, uh, many, uh, any questions where students can, can who, is somebody here? 
You're the, you're the guy? Okay, great. And, and many answers. And, and many answers to me is the 724 access to, to learning resources that ev anyone potentially could contribute to. Uh, so we already have the platform. We just need to build on it. Would you like to comment about that? Um, well, we actually, looking at the traffic that comes to Many Answers, we have, uh, in the last quarter, we had 13,000 uh, visits from within New Zealand. We had 2,000 from America. Um, the top 50 entries on Many Answers in the last quarter, 30 of them were from New Zealand, kind of focused things. So it's driven by local information. That's what they're after. Um, funnily enough... Ten, over 10% 10 of, of the traffic to Many Answers is driven by students going to our entry on NCA exam papers because they can't find it. They can't find the information when they go to the site. So that is overwhelmingly our most popular entry, um, which is saying something about the NCA exam papers website. That it's, and we've, our entry on that has had 13 different iterations since 2008. Because um, they keep on changing the site, students can't find anything. So it's. Yeah, yeah. So they come to us. And we have, I mean, if you look at the entry, it's, 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 it's huge. And the amount of engagement that goes on with that. And um, we have uh, entries on there where basically students respond to entries. So um, the Aparananata entry we have on there, that has been uh, had three different iterations in the last uh, six months, probably, in reaction to what students have uh, said that they want with it. So we're not giving them the answers. We're still not giving them the answers, but we're giving them direction on how to find the information, and we're responding to what they're wanting. Um, so we do that continually through that. And it's quite interesting with the entries we have on Many Answers, the, um, the Maori themed entries, we actually have a college in Northland who they have requested that we have our uh, Maori themed entries translated into Te Reo. They don't use our Uina Pato service with a live online kind of thing, but they access us in Te Reo through our Many Answers entries. So, yeah, there's a lot of space for that. I mean, that site we, we've, we're 35% up on. Um, that's the traffic to that site this year, so it's getting used more and more and more. Um, we've done a whole lot of developments in that. I've gone from a team of four people a year ago doing four entries a term to now I've got about 30 people doing about 65 to, uh, well, 60 to 75 entries a term. So, yeah, that, that, yeah we're, we're doing a lot of work with that. So. Would you like help? Oh, I'd love help, yeah, yeah. Um, I just um, I just make one comment of that I think because one of the things uh, in terms of and I was over at a few of the inquiry things in terms of the the flip classroom and um, online more online services and students leading their own learning and twenty four seven learning is I think the challenge in that um, is if we if if that's the driver is the driver because we want our students to be learning all the time or is it because our teachers aren't doing a good enough job in the time slots we give them or is it because we want them to, uh, or, or are we challenging the idea of what public education is, and and what is the role of a, you know, a an education professional? Um, and this came up in one of the health things we talked about yesterday, where they said, um, you know, the nurse with the online technology can see four times as many students, uh, four times as many um, patients. And I thought, well, what does that say about a their workload and the expectations and what we believe this health professionals to do? I know if I'm a parent, you know, I'm a father of a three-year-old, um, and I work, you know, eight to five every day. If I'm 24/7, uh, there's a stretch on what I can do with my life, um, and that's an interesting, com you know, society conversation. I think about what learning is, and then how education delivers that. Just because the technology can allow us to deliver all that, does it make it better? <laughs> I suppose what I'd say to that. But Claire, and then... I guess in response to what you just said, I, I see the role of, as a, a role of an educator is to teach students to learn for themselves. Like, I've, I've, I've always held the position that as an English teacher, I'm never going to go into the room and provide the answers, but I'll provide them with the questions and the guidance to have the discussion themselves and find their own answers. So I do expect them to be going out there and, you know using any questions and any other means possible to, to seek out information and knowledge and be able to synthesise and make use of that information. Um, I, I missed the very beginning of the session, so I apologise if this 
is a double up, but I think we've also got to deal with the, the thing that's always going to stand in the way of collaboration for teachers. This was touched on our last session and at several other sessions, is the default policy that exists in schools at the moment around all resources created by teachers within a school and the students and work that they create, the default IP of um, those resources are owned by the Board of Trustees of that school, which fundamentally quashes any collaboration beyond your school anyway. You know, but the reality is a lot of people don't even know that and, and so just go forth and do it anyway. But I think... Well, well I think you're right, we do do it anyway, but yeah. I think it would be quite a not seismic, but it would be a major shift to actively say our policy is to share and it's in how we create our IP and it's right there in the yeah. small print. Well, I think it needs to come from a national, from, from the top, and it needs to um, signal to all schools that the default expectation is that everything we produce is the property mm. of all educators yeah. in New Zealand. And it'd be interesting to see they defend the rights of certain rights holders quite well, mm. whether or not they defended the rights of educators. <laughs> Uh, final comment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, do you want to? Yep. Um, I am a first year teacher, um, and it really amazes me that people still think, um, are kind of shocked by this idea that students are learning without teachers. I mean, um, if I look at my own experience as a um, student last year, we had a Facebook group, and it would be questions like what should you wear to your placement through to more meaty questions about pedagogy and that was something that the students organised themselves and I actually don't see that as being a problem going down even further into the education system, secondary or even depending on age issues into intermediate and primary. I think we need to be teaching kids at a far earlier age about how you interact um, online to enhance your learning rather than sort of sequestering them off. So that was just my little tidbit that came out of this discussion. Great. I mean, yeah. We, we've um, heard within the hui so many examples of, of how kids are interacting badly online. Maybe if, if we gave them more examples of how to, how to interact positively online, then, then we could counter that. Um, we have run out of time, um, and thank you to everyone who's come along and contributed. Um, please continue the conversations, uh, and because it's my session, I'm going to be a little bit self-indulgent and to say that uh, education is really powerful, but for me, every morning when I wake up, that is my little girl, and, and she learns every day, and she shows me things every day, uh, and she's already learnt that it's not good to land on the tax bracket on the Monopoly Square, um, but... That, this is, for me, what it's about. So thank you very much for sharing. Keep sharing. Have a good afternoon.